Hello everyone. Welcome to the week four of St. Joseph's philosophy course. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about ontology and being. Today, we're going to transfer more into some tools so we can look through philosophy and we're going to focus on applying it to the real world. Through understanding this, we're going to explain certain problems, such as the problems of evil. We're going to look at our moral obligation to the environment, as well as understanding is poison ivy truly poisonous and is sugar bad for us? So today the first tool we're going to look at is what's called the four causes. Now among the Thomistic and Aristotelian philosophy, everything is looked at through the view of the four causes. Now the first of these is the material cause. I'm sure you're all familiar with the material cause. It's more or less what we call matter in a material substance. So the material cause is the stuff that a thing receives. For this material cause or this stuff receives a form of something else. Let's give an example. In the past, we've talked about the sculptor and he's taking the marble and he's putting a form in to that marble to make a sculpture. That marble is the matter and that matter is passive. It receives a form. It receives that idea that is in the mind of the sculpture. The next is the formal cause. Now the formal cause is the idea or concept that we've talked about in the past, the form. So in the case of a sculptor, there is the piece of marble and the form or idea that is in the mind of the sculptor, of the sculptor is placed into the marble itself. So that marble becomes a composite of the matter itself, which is marble, and the form, which is the accidental change in the marble. Next, you have the end cause or final cause. Now, the final cause is the very purpose of a thing. All things are created with a, perfect, with a purpose or desire. For example, think of the sculpture. Now, someone made that sculpture for a purpose whether it be I'm an artist and I wish to get money, or I love art and I wish to create beauty. Now, form is created to fulfill this end. When I am a sculpt, when I am making that sculpture or that statue, I have an idea, a form in my mind that is going to achieve this end. Now matter can be disposed different ways to achieve different ends. Let's take metal can be formed a certain way to form an anchor and have certain properties of that anchor, or it can be formed another way to make a plane be formed completely differently because the purpose of that plane or that accidental form that is imposed on that matter is for a different purpose in a plane than it is in an anchor. Next is what we have is called the efficient cause. Now the efficient cause is the agent that imposes a form on the matter for the sake of an end. So we can see that in a sense the form or sorry, the purpose is the first and the last cause. It's the first because when the agent cause decides he wants to make something, he has a purpose or a need. And after seeing that purpose or need, 
he develops that form which he places in the matter to attain the end he wishes to attain. So let's take, for example, a car. Now, a car is desired by an agent for a particular purpose. Now, a car is uh, uh, an agent wants to go somewhere. He wants to travel and he wants to travel with a particular speed. He could walk. He could take a horse, but a car is much faster. Once he's identified this need and purpose he has, he then begins to fashion a car and create a car to properly attain his final end. Now, depending on whether he wants to haul equipment or race another car or carry people, is going to determine how he designs this car. So the form and the way the form that's put into the matter is determined by the agent insofar as it is capable of achieving its end. And we see different types of cars because different efficient causes wish to attain or achieve different ends with different forms. Now, the, among efficient causes, this can be broken down even further. One of these is called the principal cause. Now let's take the motion of a car. What causes the motion in the car? Now we can give a few different answers, but the thing that causes the motion through its own intrinsic power is it's called the motor. And the motor, because it has this intrinsic ability to cause a motion, is the principal cause of the motion in the car. Now, usually a car will have a motor and then that motor will turn gears, which will turn the wheel. Now, those gears are also a cause in the motion of the car. But those gears do not have the power to cause motion themselves. Rather, they are given motion by the motor. So we call those gears an instrumental cause because they are used by the principal cause, which is the motor, to cause motion in the car. Now, the gears receive motion and transfer it. We could also say the gears are used as an instrument by the motor to move the car. Now there's also what we call a remote cause. And a remote cause is another efficient cause, but the, re the remote cause is off in the distance. It keeps the thing the way it is. Let's give an example. So if I am a human being and I design this car, for the car to even start or to begin, someone needs to first make the action of turning on the motor to start the motor into motion. This agent that started the motion, the motor into motion, that doesn't actually move it, but is responsible for allowing the motor to function is called a remote cause. Now all when we look at all of created being, God is a remote cause of all created being. And the reason is because being cannot exist if God does not continually give it existence. So God is a remote cause of all created being. All right, so how can we apply our understanding of causality to the real world. Let's look at a few more examples. Let's take a statue. So like we said before, you have the marble that you're trying to shape and that's your matter. You have the idea in the artist, let's say Michelangelo. So that's the form, this idea. But 
you also have an agent, the person who makes the statue. The agent in this case is a person that decide that the principal cause who's working to make this statue. You also have an instrumental cause, such as the chisel and the hammer. Remember, the chisel and the hammer in of themselves don't have the power to make the statue. Rather, they are controlled by the principal cause, and they are the ones that allow the statue to be made. But they do not do it through their own power. They do it through the power and the manipulation of the principal cause. Next, we can say there's also a remote cause. Let's say there is a wealthy merchant who wishes to, perp to purchase a beautiful statue. Now, insofar as Michelangelo, the sculptor, is concerned, the statue may be created for the sake of attaining money because he's a poor sculptor and he needs to feed his family. Now that's the more closer end, but there might even be an ultimate end in this because Michelangelo is a father with children. We can say that the ultimate end that he wishes to get money and feed his family is because he has a duty to do this to God as a father and a husband. So even though the more near end is to attain money. The ultimate end of this could be to glorify God. Now, if there's a merchant who is looking at this statue and he wants to buy it from Michelangelo, he is now another, he is the remote uh, cause of the statue for he commissioned Michelangelo. Now, it was not through his power that the statue was built, but he asked for it to be done. He raised the money and he commissioned Michelangelo to go about making the statue. Now, unlike Michelangelo, who is creating the statue for the sake of money, his end is for money. The purpose of the statue in relation to the person who paid for the commission, they would say the cardinal, he wishes to have something that is beautiful, that can be placed into a church and glorify God or assisting people in their prayer life. So we can see how this idea of causality can be applied to very simple things in our life. So let's take material substances. Now, a material thing like copper, gold, these are material substances and they can all be understood through the four causes. Let's start with the first, it's matter, it is the very stuff that gives a thing its material being. Next is the form. There's some sort of form that gives things their being, as we talked about in week three. Now, there also has to be an agent cause or efficient cause. Remember that form has to come from somewhere. Where is the cause of that form? So before the world is created, in the, divine, in the divine intellect, these forms exist. God has certain purposes. Gold is to be like gold. Stone is to do what stone does. And water does what water does. Different properties and characteristics. God sees the ends and then he creates the form of these things in accord with the ends. So gold, copper, all the material things are on this earth to serve a particular end and a particular purpose. So let's look a little more closely at how these things can change and affect us. Now, because things are created for a certain purpose and a certain end, we can also see that things can happen by chance. Now, some people object and say chance can't exist because God knows all things. This is true, but it does not mean that there is no chance. 
So when St. Thomas talks about chance, what is he talking about? If we look very closely, we can see that this truly does exist, even in a world where there is a God. Let's take, for example, a farmer. Now a farmer plows his field, right? And he plows a field for the end of feeding his family and making money. Now, let's say the farmer is plowing his field to feed his family and to make money. And while doing this, he hits some metallic object. He then finds that this metallic object is a treasure chest holding a lot of gold. Now, the farmer was not looking for gold. The farmer was merely doing a task for the sake of growing crops and feeding his family. However, in doing this end, something else occurred, which was finding the gold. So we would say he found the gold by chance. Now, we can use this to understand the problem of evil. So how does this work? Let's say, for example, that we are walking to the woods and a tree falls on someone and they die. Now, someone might say, how could a good God allow this tree to fall on someone and kill them? For God could not do this without causing the tree to kill someone because he is the cause of all things. Therefore, God is evil. What is the answer to that? The answer is that though God allows this to happen, he does not desire it to happen. First, God only allows evils so that a greater good can be brought about. Now let's take the example of the tree. Now, a tree does not hit someone because it was designed to. It hits them by chance. So when a person is walking through the woods and a tree falls on them, it falls on them simply because the gravity is pulling that branch down and because the characteristics of the environment at that time brought that branch down. Now, if God designed trees in such a way that they only fell when men were walking underneath them, then we could say that God tried to kill that person. However, if that tree only fell because it was moving toward the earth or toward mass, as all objects do with grav material objects do with gravity, then that person was not killed as a desire by God, but rather that person was killed by chance. The same is true with any other evil situations in our life. For example, there are people who murder and do horrible things. And God keeps them in existence. He allows these things to occur. But that does not mean God is culpable for these actions. For though God allows them to happen, he is only the remote cause. He is not directly causing the evil. For man has an intellect, which is good. Man can know and do things, which is good. However, man chooses to do evil things. That choice and that free will is respected by God because a greater good can come about, which is the ability to love. If we don't have free will, we cannot love. So God honors that free will and that capacity to do evil things because he knows greater good will come about. Now, oftentimes people will complain that something horrible happened to them and how would God be a good God if he let this happen? And the answer is that through those evil things, God will always allow a greater good to come about, 
even if we don't know or understand it. Just like a wise parent will discipline their kids and punish them and make them suffer for the greater good. Often, the child who is young and ignorant cannot understand the wisdom of the parents. So too we who are vastly ignorant compared to God cannot necessarily understand God's plan, but we can be sure of his goodness that he only allows these evils we experience so that a greater good can be brought about. So we see that the problem of evil is not really a problem. It's only an apparent problem. Now let's take the four causes and ask the question, who killed Jesus? This is a question you hear in many places. Some people say it's the Jews. Some say it was Pontius Pilate. Some say it was a soldier. But who was responsible for deicide, for killing God? Well, we can examine this through the four causes and we can come with a very precise answer. The first person who can be said to be remotely responsible for the murder of Jesus and killing God is actually God himself. Now, what do we mean by this? If we look in the Old Testament, we see passages about Eon, the perfect lamb, who will, be who will be sacrificed, the scapegoat, for other sins. For in the very beginning, there was a plan that Jesus Christ would become man and die for the sins of others. So in this sense, we can say God was a cause of the death of Jesus. Now, God did not desire the negative effects. Rather, he allowed this horrible, tragic experience. The father allowed his son to be murdered for the greater, what he deemed to be the greater good of the redemption of humanity. The next would be Pontius Pilate. Now, unlike God, who is the remote cause, a very distant remote cause, Pilate is also a remote cause, remote efficient cause, but he's a little closer. If you remember, Pontius Pilate was asked by the Jews um, if they could kill Jesus Christ. And Pilate said, I wash my hands of this. He could have said yes, and he could have said no, but instead he just deferred his decision to the Jews and gave them the authority to, to decide what to do. So that means, since the Jews had the authority, they were calling the shots. This order to kill Jesus or not to kill Jesus came from the Jews. That means that the Jews were the principal cause of the death of Jesus on the cross. Now, the Jews weren't the actual ones who executed Jesus. Someone had to carry this out. And this is the instrumental cause. Because the Jews ordered that Jesus be executed, the soldier acting through the command of the Jews carried out this command to go about and have Jesus executed. So the soldier is the instrumental cause of killing Jesus. Now the formal cause is the actual act of crucifixion, but the material cause is the cross, the nails. Now because of the, this cross and these nails are actually a material cause of the death of Jesus, this is the reason why the, this cross has become a symbol of our Christian faith and our hope in the resurrection. Now we can see how causality can be applied to real life situations. And it's not just a philosophical puzzle. 
Now we're going to turn to another part of philosophy, another tool, and this is the idea of per se and per accidents. It's very simple. Per se is something that's performed through itself, and per accidents is something that is performed through another. It's simple to a substance and an accident, or an accident is a thing itself. It has powers and existence through itself. Or an accident like blue or softness does not have existence on its own. It only has existence when it subsists in a substance. Now let's give an example of per se and per accidents. Let's talk about whether poison ivy is actually poisonous. Now let's take something that is poisonous. What is, what is poison? Poison is something that by its power has a capacity to kill something else. So if you drink something that's poisonous, it by its power is going to kill you. Now poison ivy does not do this. There is nothing in poison ivy that will harm you. That's why people are immune to poison ivy. What happens when you, when you touch poison ivy, and most people, is that your body thinks poison ivy is harmful. And because it thinks this, it has this defense mechanism that comes up and it swells up and tries to attack the poison ivy. Now, if your body doesn't think this, the poison ivy, it just it doesn't do anything and nothing happens. And because the poison ivy in and of itself is not harmful to man, nothing happens. It is only through your body falsely reacting to that poison ivy and thinking it's dangerous that you start to have problems from swelling up and all these things. These various symptoms we see in various people turning red and rashes and all sorts of things. So since it is really just a reaction of your body and it's not a power of the poison ivy, the poison ivy is only poisonous per se, sorry, per accidents, not per se. Let's use another example. Let's look at, look at sugar. I've heard people say po sugar is poisonous. It's this horrible thing. We should get rid of sugar. Is sugar actually bad for you? Let's look at it like this. Is sugar bad per se? The answer is no. Now sugar of, in and of itself is actually vital for certain bodily functions. Now when we consume sugar, sugar will be used for energy or some of it will be turned to fat. Now fat is also not a bad thing. Fat is the way that your body stores energy so that later on your body can burn that fat and use it for energy to run the functions of your body. Now, where do we start to have problems with sugar or fat? The problem is not with sugar in of itself. Sugar is a good thing. The problem is excessive quantities. For in many other civilizations, the ex where people did not have tons of food, excessive fat was a good thing. It meant you could survive for a longer period of time. However, in our country and the civilization we live in, we have so much excess food that our problem is that we receive an inordinate amount of sugar, excessive sugar. So sugar is not bad in and of itself. In and of itself, or per se, it's a good thing, for functions of our brain cannot occur without sugar. However, excessive quantities of sugar are bad for us. Another example we can use to see the goodness of sugar is that in sacred scripture, the uh, promised land is said to be overflowing with milk and honey. Therefore, sugar is not this horrible thing but it's given to God, to man, by God, to be used, like all things, with moderation. 
All right, so we can see how sugar is really a good thing and how it's per se, it's good for us. But per accident, it can be bad when we have it excessively, excessive quantities. Now the same is true with really anything. Even water in excess can be bad. There have actually been people, athletes, who have died from drinking too much water. So water, like sugar, are both essential for life. But when they are, and they are per se, they are good. But under certain circumstances, they can be bad when they are used excessively. Okay, so we can see the problems and the applications of the idea of per se and per accidents. But let's take this a little further now. And let's go to moral theology. So let's say I am, uh, the, the Catholic Church has allowed for the execution of certain criminals. Now we see this in sacred scripture as well as in tradition and in the writings of the saints and great theologians. However, it's not quite that simple. An individual cannot go kill someone for this is murder even if I know someone is a horrible, evil person. If I take it upon myself to go kill this murderer, I am committing the sin of murder. Now, the way that person can be killed is through the authority of the state. The state has the power and authority to take people's lives for a just cause. Now, let's say I'm an executioner. And this person has been determined guilty of a certain crime, and he is to be executed on Saturday. But I hate this person. I'm an executioner, and I want him dead Monday. And I take it upon myself to go kill this person by my own power and authority. In that case, even if I'm an executioner, I have committed the sin of murder. The reason is because... My actions are per se. That choice to kill them is coming from my own desires and will. However, if as an executioner, I kill them as an instrument of the state, I kill them through the desire of the state as an instrumental cause. Yeah. Another way of saying this is I'm killing them for accidents, not per se, then I am not guilty of murder, but I am carrying out the action of the state. And it is both right and just. Okay, so we can see how per se and per accidents can apply to moral theology. And how even though the action may look the same, in both cases, you're killing someone. One is a horrible sin of murder. The other, because of causality, is right and just. Now, we can also use this understanding of per se and per accidents to understand our moral obligation to the environment. So recently, there has been a lot of talk about our obligations to the environment because of the papal encyclical Laudato Si. Now, a lot of people um, question and confuse what our obligations are. Now, a lot of people think we have a per se obligation. What I mean by that is an obligation to care for the earth for its own sake. But really, all we have is a per accidents obligation to the earth. And by per accidents, I mean an obligation to care for the earth insofar as it affects man. Now, there are some theologians such as uh, Thomas Berry who argues that we have a moral per se obligation to care for the environment. Realizing that this uh, argument cannot be found in scripture or tradition, he appeals to other sources of information. 
However, Catholics cannot adhere to this. The reason is because all public revelation ended with the death of the last apostle. So all teachings can be found in the church before the death of the last apostle, either implicitly or explicitly in scripture and tradition. Now, other theologians that are stayed within the bounds of Catholic teaching have argued for a per se obligation to the environment, but they have done this differently than Thomas Berry. They have appealed to the teaching to be stewards of the earth and to Duns Scotus. Now, Duns Scotus argues that the earth is a piece of art and God is the great artist. And we, as custodians of the earth, are required to preserve that art. For the scripture says that through looking at nature, man can see God, not directly, but indirectly, for only the fool would reject God's existence. Now, Scotus seems to understand that this is through understanding nature, through looking at the various arrangement of things. However, this is not how St. Thomas understands it. For as we talked about before, the forms exist in the mind of God. Now, just as looking at a piece of art, we can come to get a glimpse of the mind of the artist through looking at the forms of the world, we can get a glimpse of the mind of God. And it is through this that we come to know and understand God. Now, we can also understand God through revelation in scripture, but our capacity to understand God through nature or um, natural theology is primarily done through understanding God through the formal causes. Now, when we look out into the world and we see different substances, rock, gold, silver, their arrangement in the earth doesn't really matter. For a single piece of gold or a single piece of copper, through seeing the form in this and comprehending it, we're able to look and get a glimpse of the mind of God. Even plastic. Now, plastic by a lot of environmentalists is seen as this artificial, e almost evil material. But remember, man cannot truly create. All man can do is rearrange things. Now, what is plastic? Plastic is not a rearrangement of things. Plastic is a new substance. It's a completely separate substance from the things that were part of it before. So what that means is that plastic from the beginning of time existed in the mind of God. So to more clearly understand this, let's say we're trying to create water from hydrogen and oxygen. Man doesn't actually create water. Man takes hydrogen and oxygen and disposes them a certain way, and then they turn into a new substance of water. That is possible because the divine mind has that concept of water, and it takes that concept of water and puts it into what was previously hydrogen and oxygen. Now, the same thing is true with plastic. Man simply takes the materials that make plastic and dispose them a certain way and whatever materials they were before are now replaced with the form of plastic. So plastic by its nature glorifies God. When we look at plastic and understand plastic, we come to a certain understanding of God. It's very limited but it is the same way we come to a limited understanding of God through looking at the rock 
or the flower or the tree. Now, there are other people who argue for a per se um, obligation to the earth for other reasons. And we will see that these are actually false. And one of the reasons is because we need to preserve the earth because it was given to us by God and God desires it to remain in this stasis and this same way it's always been. But when we look at scripture, we find that this is not the case. Really, the earth is constantly changing. If you look in the fossil record, we can see many animals that were once existent existed that did not. We can see geologically that things have changed. In scripture itself, when God became angry, he sent a flood and flooded the entire earth. Scripture says that from this flood, the oceans came about. So we see God rearranging and disforming and changing the physical characteristics of earth. During the medieval ages, a great volcano erupted, and there was a minor ice age. Again, by nature, the earth, this supposed masterpiece, is changing and altering. For God's ultimate plan is not in the arrangement of the earth, but it's in the things of the earth. Now, there's also another argument that the higher things, the animals, have a certain obligation. Unlike the stones and the water, they're more like God because they have a certain limited intelligence. And there's an argument that we have a moral obligation to preserve the life of the different species of animals or plants. We will, when we look very closely, we will find that this is not true. And when we look at the encyclicals from the popes over the last 50 years, we do see a development in doctrine. We do see them writing about ecology. Pope John Paul II himself said, there is an ecological crisis. But what exactly does this mean? When we look very closely at the writings of John Paul II, he talks about problems of ecology, but he does not talk about saving the earth and some sort of pantheistic concept. Rather, he always talks about our obligations to the earth in relation to man. So for example, a factory that starts producing all sorts of chemicals and dumping them into the river where poor people go to drink are now being harmed. Now in this case, the moral obligation is not to preserve the river because the river in of itself is good. The moral obligation to the environment is per accidents, meaning our obligation is to keep the river clean because people drink from that river and use it to sustain their life. We see Pope Benedict also being very involved in this movement. And he talks more about this than John Paul II he even has a special liturgy for the environment. But again, like John Paul II, he never declares a per se obligation to the environment. He always talks about our obligation to the environment in relation to the good of man. Finally, we have Pope Francis. And at times it may appear, some people will think he is advocating a per se obligation for the environment. But in reality, he never actually does this. One of the more controversial things are his statements about animals and the, ex the desire to keep animals from going extinct. Now when we look at tradition and we look at the writings of St. Thomas, we will see that St. Thomas very clearly states that Animals are created for the sake of man, for the lower is created to serve the higher. St. Thomas talks about how if a man were to kill another man's horse or mule, 
It is not a sin of murder. Rather, it is a sin of theft, because he has destroyed another man's property. Now, there are some who argue that because species are good and give a certain glory to God, we must preserve each individual species from going extinct. But when we look at the geological record, we can see there are many animals that once existed that no longer do. Yet, when we look through scripture, and tradition. We don't ever see God talking about man's moral obligation to keep certain rare species of animals in existence. We also have certain decrees from the popes. Let's take malaria. Malaria is a unique species of bacteria that causes disease. However, from the popes we have had decrees calling for the eradication of this bacteria. Now there, if we had a certain obligation to keep things from going extinct because through their uniqueness, they glorify God, then there should be a call to extinct most of bacteria, but keep it alive in some sort of zoo or museum where it can still have a certain special existence. But that was never asked for. What was asked for by the popes is for this thing to be completely eradicated for the good of man. Now let's say there was an island and on the island is a dinosaur, okay? Now, this is a island of Catholic farmers and they have the last two female Tyrannosaurus rexes alive on the island. Now that those dinosaurs are eating the sheep and they're threatening the livelihood of those farmers. Those farmers do not have a moral obligation to preserve and rustle down and save those dinosaurs from going extinct. Rather for the good of the families and for preserving the people of that island, they have an obligation to go out and kill those dinosaurs for the good of society. So you can see how the idea of per accidents and per se applies to the environment. And we can see that man's obligation to the environment is not to the environment in and of itself, but it's ultimately directed toward the good of man. That's it for today's talk. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. If you have any questions, Post a comment down below. Have a nice day.